Welcome to everyone who is watching this first worship service of the new year, 2021, here at Rose Hill Presbyterian Church. We hope uh, everyone is staying healthy and is, uh, will be blessed in this new year that we are entering into. Let's begin this worship service with our call to worship from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. We will hear a new song. I invite you, if you have a Trinity hymnal, to turn to Psalm uh, uh, Hymn 100, Holy, Holy, Holy. We will hear it played. I invite you to sing along if you're able. Let us pray. Holy Triune God, we do call upon your name, your holy and uh, precious name that you've revealed to us through your word, through your scriptures. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we do call upon you as we enter into a new year. We pray that you would be our shield and our defender, the, uh, t uh, the pillar of fire and cloud that goes before us to give us guidance, to give us protection as we move forward into a new year, Lord, uh, go before us and bless our efforts, our works, but we pray above all that you would be glorified in all things, and we pray this now in your name. Amen. So we prepare for the ministry of the word. It's good for us to reaffirm our faith, to confess our faith together, and so I will be uh, leading us in the Apostles' Creed. If you know the words by heart, please uh, say them along with me. Let's see. Confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's indeed uh, uh, reaffirm our faith as we come uh, in faith and in trust to the word of God. And our scripture reading today is uh, from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 14. We're past the season of Advent, and for our messages this past Advent, we were focusing on the theme of dreams in the stories of Christ's birth in uh, Matthew chapter 1 and chapter 2. But of course, the major emphasis of the uh, theme of, uh, a major emphasis, theological emphasis of Advent is the incarnation. And so before we got too far past Advent and Christmas, I wanted to do one sermon specifically on the subject of the incarnation of the Son of God, that is, uh, is permanently taking on a human nature and a human body alongside his divine nature. The early uh, church father, uh, Athanasius, he wrote one of the classic works on the subject of Christ's incarnation, and he made the observation that when Jesus became incarnate, that is, when he took on a human flesh and blood, a human body, and he writes... He was not limited and confined by the body, but held it under his control so that he was both in it, that is, in his body, and also in all things and outside all created things, reposing in the Father alone. Indeed, the wonderful thing is that at one and the same time as man, he was living a human life as word, as the divine word, he was sustaining the life of the universe. And that's really a tremendous thought. Colossians 1 verse 17 says that in Christ, all things, uh, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Jesus is the one who holds the universe together. And he was doing that even when he was, in human terms, just a baby in terms of his human development. He was holding all things in the universe together even when, as a human infant, he couldn't feed himself or clothe himself or bathe himself. That is amazing. Well, let's turn to our text, Hebrews chapter 10, reading verses 1 through 14. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Let me pause for a second there. Hebrews is quoting Psalm 40 at that point, and that psalm is using a very common type of rhetoric in the Bible. Oftentimes uh, when a Bible writer, an Old Testament writer says, not this, but this, what he's really saying is not only this, but also this. And so uh, in those verses there, verses 5 through 7 of Hebrews, uh, the quotation from Psalm 40, the psalmist isn't denying that God required sacrifice and offering in the Old Testament. Uh, He's saying that he required not just that, but also something more. And the psalmist is speaking prophetically there, of Jesus Christ. What the psalmist is really saying is that the Lord not only required the sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament era, but also he prepared a body for the Lord's anointed Savior, Jesus Christ, so that he might be the final ultimate sacrifice. The author of Hebrews just said in verse 4 that it was impossible for the blood of bulls 
and goats to take away sins, even though those sacrifices were, were very clearly commanded in the Old Testament. It's just that something more was needed in addition to those sacrifices, and that was the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Picking up in verse 8. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless the reading and the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have given us this means of grace, your scripture. Lord, you have uh, said so much to us in that very large book, uh, too much for us to take in just at one sitting, but we pray, Lord, that as we focus on uh, just these verses this morning, that you would enlighten our minds and that you would uh, change our hearts and change our lives. We pray this in your son's name. In 2004, an Englishman named Ashley Revel sold absolutely everything that he had, his car, watch, golf clubs, his entire wardrobe, all of his personal possessions, and he boarded a plane for Nevada and placed all the money, along with all of his bank savings, his life savings, on a double or nothing wager at a roulette wheel at the Plaza Hotel and Casino on the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, Ravel rented a tuxedo for the occasion because he didn't even own any good clothes at that point. He had sold all of those as well. And so it all came down to this. If he chose the right color for the roulette wheel's spin, red or black, he would double the amount of his bet, which was around $135,000 pick the wrong color, and he would lose it all. He was literally staking everything he had on the outcome of this one single event. And there's a certain parallel here with the Bible, uh, which also stakes everything on its key doctrines. The Bible stakes the entire Christian faith, uh, not on a single game of chance, but on certain crucial teachings. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is one very obvious example of this. If the resurrection of Jesus didn't actually take place on Easter Sunday, the Bible says that we can all just pack up and go home because this whole Christianity thing is bogus, completely bogus, if the resurrection didn't really take place. The Apostle Paul he famously says, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Or in verse 17, uh, he again says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. And so Paul is saying that there's really no point in coming to church, there's no point whatsoever, if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. Right there, the Bible stakes everything on the doctrine of Christ's resurrection. Or another example would be the doctrine of justification by faith. That is, uh, uh, the Bible's teaching that God forgives you, he declares you to be just, declares you to be a righteous person, not in any response to uh, any good deeds that you've done for him or for other people, uh, not because you've worked to earn his forgiveness in any way. No, God declares you to be righteous on account of Jesus Christ's perfectly righteous life, which he's willing just to, 
to reckon to you if you only trust in Christ or believe in Christ, have faith in Christ. And that's the doctrine of justification by faith alone. And the Bible stakes everything on that doctrine as well. So, for example, in the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul, uh, he, he treats this doctrine very extensively, very passionately, and he says in Galatians chapter 1 that if anyone, even an angel, teaches something other than this gospel of justification by faith, Paul says, let him be anathema or cursed eternally condemned as some translations render it if you're not on board with this doctrine of justification by faith paul is saying then you are outside the bounds of the christian faith and so again you see the bible stakes everything on the doctrine of the resurrection the doctrine of justification by faith that is how important they are without these things the entire christian faith crumbles to the ground Now, it's not a gamble with a percentage of winning and losing like the chance that Ashley Revell took in 2004. The chance of winning an all-or-nothing spin on a Las Vegas roulette wheel is apparently, this is what I'm told, 47.3%. So you have a little less than 50% chance of winning. In other words, actually, a coin toss would have given him better odds. I should mention, by the way, that Ravel's whole story, it was filmed as a kind of short reality series by a British uh, filmmaker with the title, wait for it, Double or Nothing, big surprise there. And I'll say this because I know everyone will be distracted unless I mention it, I'll tell you the outcome. He picked red and the spin that came out was number seven, red. So, Revel uh, actually did double his wealth that day, so for him that was a gamble that paid off. Uh, I don't recommend gambling, of course. And as I said, the Christian faith, it should not be viewed as a game of percentages. Um, The uh, philosopher, uh, Blaise Pascal, once devised his famous wager to argue that it's better to believe in Christianity, even if you aren't absolutely certain that it's true uh, because the stakes are so high. According to Pascal, you know, if you follow Christianity and it turns out not to be true, uh, well, he argued, then you haven't really lost anything. But if, on the other hand, you choose not to believe it, but it turns out to be true in the end, well, then you've lost everything. So he said that even if you viewed it as a wager with some amount of uncertainty in it, He said it would be better to, you know, sort of place your bet that Christianity is true rather than that it's false. Well, I don't like that because it treats the Christian faith as a game of percentages, like a gamble or a wager, which is something that the Bible never does. The Bible proclaims an absolute objective truth. Still, I think you all understand what I mean when I say that the Bible, it contains these doctrines that are so important, so fundamental, that it treats them like an all or nothing proposition. If this one thing isn't true, then none of it's true. If the resurrection isn't true, then none of it's true. If justification by faith isn't true, then none of it is true. It stakes everything on these key doctrines and The same holds true for the doctrine of Christ's incarnation. The Bible stakes everything on that doctrine as well. The the incarnation, it's also a a key, fundamental, all-or-nothing biblical teaching. You want to know how important the doctrine of Christ's incarnation is? Scripture says that if you don't affirm the incarnation... If you deny that Jesus Christ took on real human flesh and blood, then you're the Antichrist. That's exactly what the Bible says. It says that if you don't believe that Jesus, in addition to being God, was also a real 
honest-to-goodness man with an honest-to-goodness body, you are an antichrist. 2 John, verse 7, John the Apostle writes, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. John knew of some people who didn't believe that Jesus Christ had taken on human flesh. In other words, they didn't believe in the incarnation, and he calls them antichrists. And he says basically the same thing in his first epistle as well, 1 John chapter 4. He says, every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist, which you've heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Just as the doctrine of Christ's resurrection, doctrine of justification by faith, are, are dividing lines betwe between what uh, real biblical Christianity is and what it isn't, same deal with the doctrine of Christ's incarnation. To confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is to make a distinctly Christian confession and vice versa, to deny that he came in the flesh is to make an anti-Christian confession. So don't anybody think that it's possible to be a Christian while denying the incarnation at the same time. The incarnation is a fundamental Christian doctrine. The Bible makes that clear. And uh, the early church understood this as well. Uh, that's why the Athanasian Creed, which was probably not actually written by Athanasius, though it's very ancient and it's very much in accord with his line of thinking. The Athanasian Creed says this, whosoever wishes to be saved before all things, it is necessary that he hold the Catholic faith, which faith, if anyone does not keep it whole and unharmed, without doubt, he will perish everlastingly. At not a wager, not a percentage, without a doubt, one will perish everlastingly if one doesn't hold to certain biblical teachings, which the Athanasian Creed then goes on to specify. So, for example, it says, It is necessary to everlasting salvation that one should faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is both God and man equally he is God from the being of the Father, begotten before the worlds. And he is man from the being of his mother, born in the world. Perfect God and perfect man, having both man's rational soul and human flesh. That's speaking about the incarnation. Christ taking on human flesh and human nature. And the creed concludes... This is the Catholic faith, which if anyone does not believe faithfully and firmly, he cannot be saved. Doesn't matter how you put it. The Bible says that if you deny Christ's incarnation, you're the Antichrist. <laughs> the Athanasian Creed says that if you don't faithfully and firmly believe Christ's incarnation, you cannot be saved and instead, without doubt, you will perish everlastingly. Why does scripture and why do the ancient creeds of the church place such high stakes on Christ's incarnation? What makes this such a fundamental doctrine? Why did the apostle John, why did the church father Athanasius, why did they get so worked up about this particular point of theology about the incarnation? What's the big deal? There's many reasons. Um, there's just one that I want to focus on this morning from our text in Hebrews chapter 10. And it's simply this. Uh, Jesus needed to take on human flesh to have a human body so that he could become the sacrifice for our sins. The only way that he could be physically nailed to the cross and executed in the place of sinners 
was by taking on a physical, mortal, human body and human nature. As the eternal second person of the Trinity, God the Son, Jesus couldn't have been physically nailed to the cross because, of course, as God, he didn't have a physical body. It was only when he became incarnate, when he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, born in a stable in Bethlehem, it was only then that he was physically capable of being crucified for our sins. This is one of the chief reasons why the doctrine of the incarnation is so important, so vital. Without it, there would have been no one to pay the penalty for your sins, and you would bear the punishment for them yourself. That is why it's so vitally important that Jesus had a body, human flesh and blood. We read in our scripture text, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It was in his body that he was made an offering, a sacrifice for sins. You could also think of 1 Peter 2, verse 24. It says that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree, that is, on the cross, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds, physical, bodily wounds, mortal wounds, you've been healed. You can't wound Almighty God. It's not possible to wound him physically because God himself is a spiritual being. He doesn't have a body like men, as the Judy Rogers song correctly says. It was only when the Lord Christ took on a human body that it became possible to wound him, to inflict on him those wounds by which we are healed. Athanasius writes this in his classic book on the Incarnation. He says, As the Word who is immortal and the Father's Son, it was not possible for him to die. And this is the reason why he assumed a body capable of dying when he offered his own temple and bodily instrument as a substitute for the life of all he fulfilled in death, all that was required. Or as Athanasius puts it even more powerfully in another place, he put on a body so that in the body he might find death and blot it out. It's often been said that Jesus was a man born to die, and uh, rightfully so. We shouldn't celebrate Advent without at least some looking ahead to Good Friday and the suffering of the cross that were eventually to follow Christ's incarnation. We should always think a bit of Good Friday during Advent. I also want to say that we should never think about the incarnation and the cross of Christ without also thinking of God the Father's love, of the Father's willingness, his desire to send his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and without also thinking of the Son's willingness and desire to be sent and to be sacrificed for our sakes. And you really get this sense of desire and willingness in our reading from Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verse 5 of Hebrews chapter 10. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me, and burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. God didn't desire animal sacrifices and offerings as much as he desired to make a body for his son, to send his son to take on human flesh. God desired that. He took delight in the incarnation of the word. 
And the Son took delight in becoming incarnate. Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, Hebrews 10, verse 7. That's God the Son talking to God the Father. The Son delights to do his Father's will, just as the Father delights in seeing his Son's obedience. The Father doesn't desire animal sacrifices and burnt offerings and sin offerings as much as he desires the obedience of his Son because, as 1 Samuel 15 says, to obey is better than sacrifice. Jesus came to obey his Father's will, and he delighted to obey it. He was glad to take on human flesh at his Father's command, even though he knew full well uh, the suffering that would mean for him later on. I mean, he was God. He had to know what was coming. But he was glad to do it because it was his Father's will, his Father's desire. The Son desired to carry out the plan that the Father desired to bring about. And it was the Father's will, the author of Hebrews says, that caused all of this to happen. God the Son says, verse 7, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. And then verse 10 says, By that will, the will of God the Father, by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. It was God the Father's will, it was his delight to sanctify us through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Do we really uh, appreciate just how much God delights to save us? The Puritan pastor, William Gurnall, once wrote this. He says, you now know the reason why God stands so long waiting on sinners, months, years preaching to them. It is that he may be gracious in pardoning them and in that act to delight himself. Princes very often pardon traitors to please others more than themselves or else it would never be done, but God does it chiefly to delight and gladden his own merciful heart. What I want you to see here is how great God's heart is. You know, the Father didn't send the Son to earth grudgingly. You know, the way we often do things. It wasn't this sort of grumpy, frustrated, you know, guess I've got to fix this clean up this mess that those humans made. No. Scripture says that he delights to show mercy. It's his will, it's his desire to prepare a body for his son and to crush your sins in that body. Just as it was Christ's will and his desire and his delight to take on a human body and to endure all of that. All this, it reveals to you the heart of God. As another Puritan, Richard Harris, put it, mercy pleases him. It is no trouble for him to exercise mercy. It is his delight. We are never weary of receiving. Therefore, he cannot be weary of giving, for it is a more blessed thing to give than to receive. So God takes more satisfaction in the one than we in the other. You know, just think about that for a minute. It's saying that the joy, the delight, the comfort you feel in knowing that your sins have been forever removed from you by the cross of Christ is actually not as great as the joy that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have in removing your sins from you. For it is more blessed for God to give you that gift than it is for you to receive it. God delights in giving salvation more than we delight in receiving it. He enjoys our salvation even more than we do. As we've concluded the season of Advent and the yearly reminder of Christ's incarnation, let's really remember the reason for the season. It's all about the incarnation of Jesus, God the Son. 
about the body that the Father prepared for the Son. And it's about the pleasure that it gives God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to grant salvation to poor, fallen, bankrupt sinners. It is indeed more blessed to give than to receive, and the Sovereign Lord himself models what he commands. We'll take some time to pray for the needs of our congregation and the world. And at the end, we will say the Lord's Prayer. I invite you at home to uh, participate as you're able. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have indeed uh, shown us your love uh, so fully and completely in sending your Son, Lord Jesus. Uh, thank you for uh, being willing, for delighting to submit to your Father's will and to uh, take up our uh, poor case, our uh, needy situation you took upon yourself, that we might be redeemed, that we might be lifted up to a new uh, heavenly life. Uh, make us responsive to that, Holy Spirit. We pray that we might live lives of thanksgiving and uh, that we might be living sacrifices uh, in response. We do want to intercede for those in need. We want to pray for all those in ill health, whether due to COVID or to other factors. We pray for those in our church family, for the Featherstones, for the Martins, the, for Karen Miller, for the Parks family, and all others who are not feeling well. We pray for healing. We pray for uh, comfort and encouragement. Lord, we pray for those who are discouraged in other ways, or lonely, and we pray for your ministry to them. Lord, uh, be that friend who sticks closer than a brother to each one who's uh, um, lonely or grieving, uh, who's burdened in one way or another. Lord, we pray that the trials of the year that's passed would help people to see their real need of you. We pray this for ourselves, and we pray it for, uh, the, for our community, for our country really for the whole world, Lord, may we all uh, be uh, awakened to the reality of not just mortality, but the, our true need and dependence upon you. We also want to pray for your blessing on the new year ahead. We pray that you would uh, bless uh, Rose Hill. We pray you would help us to continue to grow and flourish. And we pray that we might grow and take new steps especially in the areas of uh, outreach and evangelism. Lord, help us to be uh, salt and light to our community. 
Lord, we pray all these things uh, confidently in the name of Jesus, your son. And now we pray using the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In response to the ministry of the word, we will hear hymn 521 from the Trinity Hymnal, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. If you have a hymnal available, I invite you to sing along with it, hymn 521, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. bless you as we go into a new year receive the lord's benediction the grace of the lord jesus christ the love of god the heavenly father and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all now and forevermore amen